Rick, how are you enjoying teaching 214A? I love it. I'm in person, I'll continue to teach. Is there another reason? Uh, indirectly, I believe she has, but I don't have direct knowledge. Well, it's great that you were willing to jump in on 214A. I think the students really appreciate it. So you're back on rehire? No, oh, Rick, just the volunteer. Volunteer, wow, that's dedication. That's good. Uh, hello, everyone. I want to call to our principal at the center. Today, we're going to have this type of contact. We'll be in the green corridor in Brazil. So, today we have Sean. Uh, uh, I'll call her Sean. Sean is a professor of technology at the graduate school of engineering at Santa Cruz at the New Graduate School. Uh, she's also a professor at the So um, I hope this can be kind of interactive. If you guys want to have, ask any question, just interrupt me whenever you want to. Um, just hoping to uh, get as much questions and interaction as possible. Because what I'm really going to go over today is stuff that's relatively well known. Uh, and so it's just kind of giving you guys a sense of the way some of us ocean acquisitions think about wave propagation problems. And especially ones in which you can uh, think about uh, the propagation along different paths or path interval approaches. So, um, so yeah, just a, some thank yous here to the Green Foundation. Um, it's been fantastic uh, having three opportunities to work here. Uh, so, thanks to Matt, my host. You know, Duncan Agnew, the gatekeeper for the Green Foundation, and then Adrian Borza uh, for being director and uh, opening up the institution after COVID for me to come and visit. So uh, over the three visits here, we've had a fairly productive partnership. So in 2000s, when Walter and I worked on our Honolulu Tide Gate paper, uh, which was actually a kind of a stochastic way wave propagation problem too. You're able to separate the deterministic 
uh, surface tide from the stochastic internal tide and look at a, hundred, a, a century long uh, response of the internal tide to the warming of the ocean around uh, Hawaii. So we worked on that, and in 2004, I wrote the book on uh, sound propagation through the stochastic ocean, which was, again, a follow-on to something Walter had done, my thesis advisor had done back in the 70s. And here we have uh, this visit, maybe we'll get some little Arctic acoustics going. So a uh, couple of funny quotes I've kind of run across, some pithy ones that the geophysicists might like this first one coming from a William Menard, who says that, frankly, the ocean is a little more than a nuisance to a marine geologist. It provides a convenient medium for the transportation of equipment, although it's regrettably unstable. Otherwise, it seems to be an unnecessary filter which obscures every bit of information that one might manage to connect, uh, to collect. And so in my last month, I've been here talking to the, the, um, the, uh, Marine seismologist, uh, seafloor geodesy group, uh, that, that see, this quote rings particularly clear or, or relevant. And another one very far, a long time ago, 1950, Carl Eckert talking about the fluctuations of sound transmissions in the ocean. Uh, long, long, uh, right when they're really starting to get the field going. So there's some really nice papers in undersea warfare uh, volumes uh, around the 50s after World War II. This one that Eckert wrote about sound fluctuations really being the most constant factor you seem to run across in the ocean. All right, so a few thoughts and goals. I mean, nothing too profound here at the top. You know, when waves propagate through a complex or stochastic medium, properties varying in space and time, the wave fields themselves will take on complex uh, space and time behavior. And so the whole idea is to try to estimate what that spatial and temporal behavior of the wave field will be. And so why do we care? So search, detection, localization, classification efforts uh, have this as a problem. So you might want to find regions where the complexity is minimized or maybe maximized or at least understood in terms of the medium properties. And this topic comes up obviously at the Naval Academy where I work a lot. Yeah, where do you hide the submarine? Where how do you find the submarine? Uh, on the other hand, the really cool thing about this problem is that the complex wave field holds information about the medium that it propagated through. So this is the age-old uh, idea of remote sensing. So remote sensing efforts seek to disentangle this information from the measurements and we look for certain aspects of the wave field that might be highly sensitive to the parameters we want to, um, to estimate. And so I'll talk about path integral theories for wave propagation in these types of, of media and their applications uh, really to this uh, search and detection remote sensing. Um, and again, so another thing too, I don't have a whole lot of time, you know, in 50 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk really more about the wave propagation physics than not so much about the medium. So that'll just be kind of a back, like a background uh, thing what, about what the medium actually is. So outline some motivational examples and kind of a conceptual picture of this complex wave propagation. Uh, we'll talk about defining acoustic, path, acoustic paths in the ocean and the fluctuations along those, those paths. So weak fluctuation theory, WFT, not to be confused with WTF. The Born approximation, wave propagation in random media, uh, path integral, that was just, uh, is derived from the Feynman path integral, but there's some extra assumptions that go into the, into the WPRM path integral that we'll, we'll talk about. And then some summary and future directions. So just some kind of fun examples here. So this is uh, an example of obviously just a calculation of sound propagation through ocean eddies. So this is a planned view of the ocean. So we have cross range and range. And you're not seeing the depth coordinate here because this is a ray calculation that has to do with the propagation of a certain acoustic mode. So we kind of play this trick sometimes in ocean acoustics. We treat the vertical uh, using normal modes, and then we'll treat the horizontal using ray theory. Um, so this was another trick that sort of borrowed from physics. And so what you can see here is a complicated ray propagation picture of the sound moving through uh, a random realization of ocean eddy. So the rays originate here on this left-hand side, going horizontally, 
And as they go out in range, they're refracted through the eddy structure, the eddy sound speed structure, and you see defocusing regions, you see focusing regions, the rays are crossing, there'll be complex interference patterns with the crossing pattern of the rays. And a really interesting thing about this problem too, is that the rays are all exponentially sensitive to initial conditions. So you have ray, ray chaos, um, positively off and off exponent. You can see in this case, maybe the, the off and off exponents around maybe a thousand to 1500 kilometers here. So that's a nice example. So you can also look at surface gravity wave propagation through uh, any current. So this is Via Villas Boas and Bill Young. So we're looking at rate propagation of surface gravity waves through a, a mesoscale field or a macro turbulence field that has vorticity. So the so-called solenoidal component, one that has no vorticity, the potential flow, and then the total. And then here you see that the vorticity is actually the main mechanism through which the rays are refracted. So you see them bending through this potential flow. There's hardly any refraction. And then the total uh, given there, focusing, defocusing, and uh, interference. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this on this picture. Some of you might have seen this before, but this is a numerical simulation of sound propagation through homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So it has the Kamolgorov spectrum, uh, and we're looking at how a plane wave moves through this three-dimensional turbulence uh, field. And so what we're showing you here, so we have depth and cross range. So again, this is a sheet. And then I'm gonna, as I run the movie, the sheet is gonna move into the turbulent medium and we'll start to see uh, variations in, of intensity occur on this sheet here. So this is a linear scale here and it's normalized by the mean. So this one means the value of the mean and 10 is 10 times the mean. Is this all a fixed time? No, no, this is time evolving as the wave propagates through the through the medium. And are you solving the ray equations here? Or are you solving, I'm solving, you solving the, the wave acoustic equation? wave equation? Fundamentally. Yeah, so this has all, all the uh, finite wavelength effects. So yeah, we'll be going past the rays, we're actually solving um, the, well, it's called the parabolic equation. <laughs> so we use. And what we're going to demonstrate is this interesting. Uh, evolution of the acoustic field as it goes out in range. So we have this thing, the scintillation index kind of means what it says. It tells you how much twinkling the signal is going to have. And that's the mathematical definition of it right there. And so what happens, well, the, the case you're going to see here in the simulation, we're going to see the scintillation index rapidly rise and it will go above one. It will peak out around two and a half. And then what happens, you get this saturation behavior where it saturates out to one. And this saturation limit is really due to the, the central limit theorem. You have so much interference going on between the different rays. You saw in the previous diagrams, you get ray interference. So, so much interference that the field is a, is a sum, random sum of lots of components. And the CLT says you go to Gaussian statistics, which actually means assimilation index goes to one. All right, so in this case here, we're going to be in a case of weak diffraction, so it's going to be very geometrical. If you do another case that I'm not going to show, strong diffraction, you actually lose that strong focusing case. And so you just saturate out like this. So let's see if we can run this. All right, so this is sort of the initial phase of the wave building up fluctuation. So simulation index of 0.4. And so you kind of see this, this web of focusing and defocusing starting to emerge, right? And that is due to the fact that you have a wave front. So you see you have this wave front propagating into the, the complex medium. There are these heterogeneities here. And so that flat wave front now will become corrugated, right? And so, see, this is where the wave front would have been. 
in the unperturbed case. And so these variations, these corrugations of the front are phase fluctuations. But the curvature of the front also tells us something about the amplitude or the intensity. So we know the ray paths, right, are perpendicular to the wave front. And so you, see, you can see here where the curvature is out, this is going to be defocusing. And then clearly where you're curving the other way, the rays are concentrating in and you get focusing. So what happens is you build up the phase fluctuations first, and then the amplitude variations follow due to this curvature. So you yeah. hear this is uh, the fluid is from a, is not unstratified. That's it's right. This fluid. is constant background. How, how stable are the RMS fluctuations of the isotropic turbulence? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's, it's, it's the sort of speed of sound in, in water is huge and. Uh, yeah, all turbulence fluctuations are like a few centimeters a second. Yeah, so it's not, it's actually the index of refraction variations that are that are causing the, so you can have two things. This simulation is only simulating index of refraction variations. So when you solve the and wave it, equation, you have a C squared in it. And that C squared is really C plus U of the velocity of the thing. But no U in this calculation. This is just C, delta C. And it's a very small perturbation. But if you go through it far enough, you build, you're going through thousands of correlation lengths of the turbulence. So this yeah, is actually 500. This might, I don't have a, I don't have a, um, a scale right. here. Because yeah, I mean, this is really just meant to be like a toy thing. Sorry. But, yeah, you're right. Don't so you, you, yeah, you can yeah. build, yeah. So in a typical place where you want to maybe do remote sensing of the turbulence, uh, you'd use something like a few hundred kilohertz sound and you'd look at 500 to 1,000 kilometer propagation path where you can really build up the variability going through many correlation lengths of the, of the weak variations. So is, okay. each, is each frame supposed to be constant phase? Is that? The deformed phase front? Yeah, so it's going through the index refraction changes with these little blobs there, and the wave front is getting advanced and, 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 and uh, delayed as it goes out. And so this is showing that first initial advance and delay. All right, so in this case, though, notice what I wrote that wave front is still single value. There's no interference going on, it's just the bending of the wave front. But as we go further and further out, then you start seeing the crossing rays. And let's go a little bit. All right, so now you get to be have a very high simulation index. And now the rays are getting concentrated down in these caustics. So like that light pattern I showed on the first slide coming through the wavy surface, this is kind of a similar looking pattern. But then also those ray traces I showed going through the mesoscale field of sound or the surface gravity waves going through the vorticity. It's all it's that concentrating down of the of the energy into these little caustic patches. And so you get very, very high simulation in this particular case. So that's going into this regime here. So we first looked at that wave front distortion. Now we look at caustics. And then if you let this thing go out into a very long range. Whoosh. So now it all kind of devolves into a speckle pattern. See the simulation index kind of asymptoting down, going down to one. All right, so those are kind of the main regimes we sort of think about when we're thinking about the, the waves moving through a complex or random medium. So that's isotropic turbulence. Oh, I should say too, if this was going through the internal wave field, it wouldn't be so symmetric. So this has got a nice symmetric looking pattern, but because internal waves are, are elongated relative to their vertical scale, we would see this thing kind of being 
squish down. So not homogeneous and isotropic, but anisotropic in the vertical and depth. All right, so another kind of cool example is in atmospheric acoustics. So this is doing acoustic propagation along a path in the boundary layer, probably on an airport runway somewhere in, in Colorado. But I'm looking at, uh, so the evolution of these complex phasers as, as the turbulence uh, gets more intense as the day comes on, and also looking at two different frequencies. So this is 600 hertz and 3,400 hertz. This number is the path length, so almost 40 meter path, 70 meter and 140 meter path. And so in the, in the morning when the turbulence is, is weak and we have sort of a low frequency, we see that the phasers just sort of hug this one. So it's normalized by the, the amplitude you would get if there was no turbulence in the boundary layer. So that's what one means. And then two or three, it's two or three times that. So here, so the phasers just kind of hang out in this little area. That's weak fluctuations like we saw over there. Now, as the day goes on, so now we're around noon, one o'clock, the turbulence is developed. The 600 hertz signal now has significant phase variation. So the phaser is kind of pointing every which way here, but you're not really getting big fade outs. So you can see there's not many points in the middle. There's a few higher points, there's a few lower points. But strong phase variations and kind of weaker amplitude variations. And then when you jump to the higher frequency, it's going to be more sensitive to that turbulent, those turbulent patches because it's having a shorter wavelength, it senses more of the fine scale of the turbulence. And so now you're getting very severe interference effects. So you're kind of filled in this whole, this whole circle here, and you see big amplitude and phase various variations too. So this is the one used for looking at these diagrams. Can you tell me what we're looking at? Yeah, so this is the complex phaser of the acoustical field. So every point here is a measurement of the acoustic field at a certain time. And so as time goes on, the point is going to move because the wind is pushing the turbulent. So the turbulent patches are getting pushed across the path, the acoustic path. The x the the, the 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 radial distance is the a and the exactly. angular distance is the phi. Exactly. So yeah, sorry about that, Steve. Um, this is yeah. So this is the phaser representation of the complex pressure, and the, all the different points are as the field is evolving in time. So it's not. You can do this also across an array, and you can look how they vary spatially. But th this is the time behavior. All right, so this is a, another way of kind of thinking about the, the way the acoustic field behaves in those different regimes. So kind of that saturated uh, regime, uh, this is the weak fluctuation regime, and this is maybe just a little bit on the edge of the weak fluctuation regime, not seeing the really strong uh, you know, scintillation where the, the value could go way beyond three. All right, so, and the last example is internal waves propagating over the continental shelf. So here's some uh, X-band radar images showing waves coming into the shore. The waves are crisscrossing over each other. So we see two different types of waves here. We see these internal tide bores, these things every 12 hours. Simulation index for the internal tide bore is about one. So it seems like it's close to the saturation. If you look at these higher frequency waves, internal solitary waves, the simulation index is about 1.9. And so they follow PDFs for the energy flux that are consistent with ideas from interfering waves. Yeah, Jacob? Um, how are you relating the scintillation index to the physical features uh, of the medium? I'm not at all. We're just okay. measuring the wave packets, looking at their energy flux. And then the, the statistics of the energy flux measurements for each packet okay. is yeah. then you can look at ensemble averages. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. So we don't really know what in the medium is causing <laughs> uh, causing these, these this interference. But we do see a need, you, hear, you do see overlapping waves. So there's interference, the waves are crossing over each other, but it's crazy interference because it's not linear waves. 
Okay, so the theoretical picture that kind of comes up is that so we see refraction, you know, focusing and defocusing. There's important diffractive effects. You know, if you have a finite wavelength, you're going to smooth over certain medium structure. We have interference. We see caustics, fade outs, glinting, the saturation behavior. And then this interesting thing about ray chaos that the, the rays are exponentially sensitive to initial conditions and to variations in the medium. Right? So we expect as the medium evolves in time, those ray paths will start jumping all around because. It's a similar type of perturbation. And you should also put nonlinear effects if you for non for acoustics, perhaps not, but for the internal waves. Yeah, 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 exactly. Waves. Yeah. Nonlinear effects. Um, yeah, this is really more of a statement about the acoustics part. So this is a whole big topic. We won't get into that, uh, but kind of interesting. Okay. Um, oops. So just a little bit about ray paths in the ocean. So these, this is a set of ray paths that for, for kind of a mid-latitude type of pro, sound speed profile. So you see them oscillating down the, the wave guide. I should have a, have a sound speed profile over here. But the important thing is each path samples the ocean differently. And each one of these paths sort of propagates down range at different speeds. Uh, so you have the behavior of individual paths, but then you have the behavior of groups of paths which, di which dictate the intensity. So if nearby paths are concentrating, getting closer, then the intensity is going up, they're moving away, the intensity is going down. They also make these caustic surfaces that you kind of see here, this little envelope of rays. And so this is kind of the basic structure of rays in the mid latitude. And so I want to show you uh, how a wavefront evolves in the ocean. And so this again is a, a ray simulation. And so we have two different displays here. We have the wavefront. So you don't see anything here because we're starting at zero range. And what we're going to do is we're going to run the simulation out in range and watch the wave the wavefront fold over itself and create uh, what we call a double accordion wavefront pattern. And then there's another display that you can use is called the phase space. So the, these are the ray equations or Hamiltonian equations in which the, the momentum or the slowness here and the depth are conjugate variables. So watching the evolution phase space is just another way of kind of seeing how the wavefront evolves. And so what I'm showing here, this line is, is a bunch of rays starting at one depth with a bunch of different angles. So that's what this means. So it's the straight line across here. And the red curve is there are the rays that are going up at the source toward the surface, and the blue ones are going down. So when I start this calculation, these rays are going to move up into shallower water. These rays can move down to deeper water because they're going down. And you'll see this thing start folding up on itself because each point on here is going to rotate at a different rate because they have different uh, ray path geometry. John, what is slowness? It's one over velocity. CG. Yeah, it's one. In this case, it's it's sine of the angle over the speed, speed of sound locally. Which is so it's kind of like wave number. It's it's a way of taking wave number and converting it into something that doesn't depend on frequency. Okay. And that depends so on the it, stratification. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's essentially KZ divided by omega. <laughs> okay, so let's run this here. All right, so this thing initially kind of go, goes out in a, in a cone, right? I, I haven't stopped it quite early. I can see it's kind of folded over here. But like initially, you know, with the point source, you have a spherical wavefront evolving out, but we're just looking at a little narrow section of the angles. So this thing propagates out, and what we'll see is that you get a caustic form. Oops. So here we got our first caustic form. So this is a where two rays are going very two nearby rays are very, very close to each other. And we'll just let this go out. And so you see the dispersion of, this, of the waveguide 
So each ray at a different angle has a different velocity downrange. And so you start uh, generating more and more paths through that wave drive. So if you have a receiver, say 500 meters, as you go out in range, you're going to you receive more and more paths. And what's amazing is that you, you see this in data. So this is amazing data that Peter and Matt got from the Philippine Sea. And so this is what we call a time front. So it's not a wave front. So there's a vertical array and you watch a wave front sweep by in time. Right, so the horizontal axis is time here. And you can see this black line is array calculation uh, that Matt did. It, it was actually off by several hundred milliseconds. I can't remember if it was slow or fast, but Matt's just shifted it over. And there's, you know, the shape is pretty good just with this shift. And so the main point here is that this ray prediction is pretty close to the observations. The ray prediction using a large scale ocean model. In this ray prediction point of view, the time front, every place on this time front is associated with a path, a single path. But the observed time front shows simulation behavior at unstable phase. So the interpretation we have is that you start with a, a path like we have here from the ocean model, but then that path kind of breaks up into, into what we call micro rays. And then the interference pattern you see, so the color differences along this path are due to focusing and defocusing of those rays. And that's, that's the picture of what's going on. And this is just some examples of measurements from the Philippine Sea. So we have these different moorings, the T moorings, and they're reporting on the DVLA. And so there are different ranges from the receiver, the DVLA receiver. And so we, we can plot simulation index versus range. And so we kind of see this behavior starting in this weak fluctuation regime down here, T6, the closest mooring, and then T1 and T5 coming up here, simulation close to one, and then T4 and T3, higher simulation values. Is DBLA the source or the receiver? It's the receiver. It's the receiver. So, so all yeah. the T's are sources. All the T's are sources. And then there's one, all of them, most of them were at 250 hertz, this one here, T2, which is down. So it's at the same range roughly as T4 and T3, but it's lower frequency. So, so here you see diffraction effects. So these ones feel more of the random internal wave field than this one does. And, oops. and another thing you can look at is coherence. I'm not going to go into this too much because I'm probably getting too long on time. But what you see when you have coherence, this is strongly phase driven. So if the phases get all mixed up as you go along the array, you lose coherence. And so these are examples of coherence functions, you know, decaying down, losing coherence as you go along the wave function. What's the ratio? The, they're varying from about 128 kilometers to 450 kilometers. Yeah. Okay, so path-based theory. So we have weak fluctuation theory initially worked out by Monk and Zachariasen, defining path integral by Dash and Plate. And the basic idea here is to start with a ray picture where there's no medium fluctuations. You have a path. And then as you add the medium and the diffractive bits, you see what's that's, what that's doing to the signal. And so the problem here a little bit is this ray chaos problem that I mentioned earlier. If you want to expand around this path that exists where there's no fluctuations, that's an unstable point to expand around. So there's some limitations. So the path-based theories uh, you use, utilize these ideas of Huygens and Fresnel. Right, so you can remember from your freshman physics classes that you know you can consider a wavefront at some point here, and every point along the wavefront is a source of wavelets, and the wavelets go out, and then you look at the envelope of the wavelets, and that gives you the front at the next location. And it's cool, you can do you know refraction, diffraction, uh, and these are the ideas that we really used in kind of the fundamental theory of uh of wave propagation through these complex media. 
So what we do is we start off, so it's weak fluctuation theory, start off with the Helmholtz equation with some background sound speed profile and some perturbation. Now, generally, this perturbation is small, like a few meters per second compared to 1,500 meters per second. So you can just expand this, this, uh, this factor in the denominator out, and you can put that on the right-hand side of the equation. And this is the equation that we go, we solve, we go after. So notice you have the left-hand side is really the unperturbed problem. And then the right-hand side is the perturbation, but it's a complicated perturbation because it involves a product of the stochastic term with the solution you're looking for. So we call, we call this a multiplicative noise problem. Uh, and that's very hard to solve. Here's some of the other, often we write the perturbation as a relative perturbation mu. So that's the small parameter that we're gonna do an expansion on. So we use the Born series. So we expand the pressure in various uh, orders of mu. We're not going to go to the second order. We're just going to worry about the first order. And so zeroth order is the unperturbed problem. First order, now we have a uh, piece of one, but now it's driven by the unperturbed pressure term on the right-hand side. So no longer is it a multiplicative noise. It's a additive noise because we already know this. <laughs> And these are easily solved because this is just a convolution of that perturbation with the unperturbed range function. And so now we have a pressure field one as an integral over all of space uh, of this, these three terms together. And physically what we're thinking about now in this solution is that you have propagation from the source to the point in space by P naught you get a Huygens wavelet at that point, and then that propagates by the Green's function to the receiver. And so here's where Huygens principle comes in. And you can imagine too, if you went to second order in this expansion, you wouldn't just go to one point, you scatter off one point, you go to another point, and then you'd scatter to the, to the receiver and so on as you go higher and higher, higher and higher in order. So the key thing here now is that the acoustic field now at the receiver is an interference pattern of all these Huygens wavelets coming in from all the different locations in space, right? So we're looking at an interference pattern again. And, what, and then what we know because this is a perturbation theory, it's the first order one, the unperturbed ray is close to the stationary phase point of this new solution. So the new ray path is not moving that much farther away from, from the unperturbed solution, because this is just the first order approximation. And then lastly, most of, or second to lastly, most of those wavelengths are gonna cancel each other out because right, we're kind of looking at stationary phase type of uh, approximation to the solution. But there is a group that's gonna, that's gonna reinforce each other, and that leads to this idea of the Fresnel radius. So there's some group of paths around the unperturbed ray. That's this one right here. So there's some group of paths that are close enough that they will reinforce. So their phases won't be the, actually technically the Fresnel radius is defined as the paths that have less than pi phase difference. So this is what we, this is how we try to add diffraction to the problem. This is the diffractive zone along the way. And then the refraction is just handled through the unperturbed Green's functions that these curves have to propagate through the waveguide and be curved in the right way. And this picture here is just the picture I drew over there. Uh, in weak fluctuations, you just get this bending of the wave front and that's where you get your phase and amplitude variations. All right, so, there's a lot of math and you can go to the book to look at it, but one of the more interesting results you get from doing that approach is you can actually calculate what the spectrum of the acoustic field is down range. And so that's what this quantity is. So it's the spectrum of phase and log amplitude. It's at some range, down range uh, value R. It turns out there's a perpendicular 
wave number resonance that comes in, I'll talk about in the next slide. So it's actually only sensitive to the waves that are moving perpendicular to the ray path. And so you have an integral over the ray path S and the spectrum. And then you have this thing, a filter called the Fresnel filter that gives you the diffractive part of the problem. And so the idea is that you have the source, a ray path receiver, and you're getting a range average of the spectrum of the medium in a plane perpendicular to this, this ray. So you're averaging that plane as you go along. Of course, that gets complicated when you have curving rays going through different stratifications. But nonetheless, what is what is F mu? You say ocean spectrum, but yeah, that's the just spe meaning? that's the spectrum of delta C over C. Okay. Yeah. So that's so that could be the turbulence spectrum, that could be the internal wave spectrum, uh, that could be uh, whatever thing you're interested in, whatever meaning you're in. But the key part is that you have if you have a multiplying effect of a filter and the ocean spectrum. So that's how you can do your inverse problem. So importantly, we get this perpendicular wave number resonance, and it really comes about by simple geometry. So you can see here, if your the ray is going this way and your wave is going this way, you get a corrugated front, you get amplitude and phase. If the ray is going this way and the wave is going that way, you don't get any change in the shape. And it's just amazing that it reduces to zero contribution from anything but perpendicular ones. That's the resonance condition. So diffraction imposes a filter. We have phase ends up being sensitive to larger scale. Log amplitude is sensitive to scales near the Fresnel zone. And that kind of makes sense, right? You have to have small scale structure that take two ray paths and spread them out or, or concentrate them down. Whereas phase is going to be sensitive to the large scale features. Um, in this case, there's no, there's no microarrays. It's just a single value thing. And again, this is an interesting potential for remote sensing because the acoustic spectrum directly relates to the ocean spectrum. And this is an example of uh, measurements. This is the log amplitude spectrum. This is the phase spectrum. So you can see a function of KZ. So you see the phase spectrum goes up to low KZ, whereas the log amplitude spectrum rolls off. And this is, this is where diffraction is rolling off the, the spectrum. So finally, to the, the WPRM path interval. So as we mentioned earlier, Monk and Zachariasen did the weak fluctuation theory. In many cases, we observe Big changes in phase and intensity. This is an example from Matt's data here. So what Matt did essentially took one of those wave fronts and straightened it out. So here you can see the signal level going up and down the wave front. So there's fade outs, there's glinting. If you look at the amplitude, it's varying along there. And here's the phase varying by almost two cycles as you go along the wave front. So the idea with Feynman path integral. It's a, it's a solution to the parabolic equation, which is a small angle approximation to the Helmholtz equation. But we'll not worry about that for now. Uh, and the idea then is that with this tool, which is a complete solution to the wave equation, it has all the wave, Huygens wavelets that you want, and that's going to give you a better solution. All right. So again, the conceptual picture. Can, yeah. so, can you just go back to the so the weak perturbation theory? You're basically you're doing this perturbation expansion in delta C on C. Exactly. Right? But this other one, you're doing a parabolic approximation, saying that the variations in the medium are only strong in one direction, not in the other direction, and that lets you do this parabolic. The, no, the parabolic approximation just has to do with the angle of propagation of the waves. So what you're saying is they're all going in one, they're going in one direction, okay. with maybe plus or minus 10 degrees at, uh, of, of variation. That, that's the parabolic approximation. Okay. So nothing about the medium. Uh, okay, so, so the kind of physical, physical picture here. So 
considered an unperturbed ocean, and we'll find with that unperturbed ocean, we want to look at a particular path that has, say, a source angle, theta ray, and a travel time, T ray. And so what you find is that nearby paths, again, no perturbations in the problem, you find that all nearby paths connecting the source and receiver will have longer travel times. So we have this blue curve here. It has a minimum travel time. It has this parabolic shape. So there's a minimum. That gives you the ray angle. And this is the travel time T ray. Now, I've been a little bit cavalier here. There, if we start thinking about all the possible paths that could connect the source and receiver and find the path integral, it involves way more parameters than just the launch angle of the ray. So I've tried, I've kind of taken this infinite dimensional space of possible perturbation parameters to the paths. And I just said, well, let's just look at this one. All right. So that's just the only way to kind of make it simple to see it on a, on a plot. But the nice view then is like now we consider like slowly turning on the sound speed fluctuations, mu. So since mu is small, we expect the new travel times uh, to develop the travel time curves to develop structure, right? So each little path here now is integrated through the random perturbations. And so we get these, this jiggly line here, the red one. Uh, because mu is small, we're assuming it's kind of going to stay close to the blue curve. And but now we see that every place where there's an extrema, either a maximum or a minimum, you're going to have a new microarray form. And those microarrays are going to be much more prevalent around the minimum where the Fresnel zone is. So close to the unperturbed ray, they're going to have small phase variations. Most of them are going to be here, but some of them are going to be out there. And so the question now arises, um, are these new microarrays significant? So to answer that, you have to ask, well, how many microarrays are generated? And what are their paths? Do they cause interference, right? Are they far enough away from the unperturbed path to interfere? And are they correlated, right? Those bright caustic bands you saw in the sunlight pattern in Southwest Australia are due to coherent microarrays all adding together. And so that's a very important property getting these strong fluctuations. So we can answer a few of these questions. So, uh, how many mic rays are generated? What are their paths? Well, it's easier to create an extreme of close to unperturbed ray. So you can create a lot of paths here, as I said, but then they're kind of within the Fresnel zone. It's going to be much harder to generate ones out here, but they might be more, uh, they'll be less numerous, but maybe more significant. So do the mic rays cause interference? Fresnel zone kind of limits that, but once you get outside the Fresnel zone, you get more interference. Are they correlated? Now, this one is a lot harder to answer. And that's why a lot of theoretical work on this strong focusing regime has been hard, because it depends on the medium correlation property. So, you know, so if the microarrays are separated from each other by more than a vertical correlation length of the ocean, so they're going through different little patches, like shown over here, if they're going through different patches, they're going to be uncorrelated. But if they're going through the same patches together, they're going to be correlated. So you kind of have this assembly of some correlated paths, some uncorrelated paths, and that whole interference pattern of these rays is going to tell you what the statistics of the, the signal is going to be. So large number of uncorrelated paths gives you the central <coughs> limit theorem result. Small number of correlated rays gives that strong focusing. So here's the path integral uh, that Roger Dashen gave us uh, to, do, uh, to do wave scattering problems. So we have the pressure field at position R is equal to, there's a normalization factor here. There's an integral all, over all possible paths. And there's just an exponential phase factor here, EVI theta, where theta is just the accumulated phase over this path. So this is the full generalization of Huygens principle. So it's a solution to the parabolic wave equation, which happens to be the same form as the Schrodinger equation. That's why Roger jumped on this problem. So the principle of least action takes the least time. 
takes the place of the principle of least action from quantum mechanics. One over the wave number Q naught plays a role in Planck's constant. So as one over Q naught goes to zero, you get ray theory, or in quantum mechanics, you get classical physics. Um, it's remarkable that this thing only involves phase. There's no amplitude term. All the paths are weighted equally in this in this cap interval. So, and again, at face value, one has to say, how the heck would you even evaluate this expression? How do you integrate over all possible paths? Well, we'll see later that it's due to another approximation of expanding around the unperturbed wave. Could you remind us what Q naught is? Q naught is the wave number. Oh. That's one, yeah, omega over C naught. So it's just a typical wave number. Um, and then another really powerful thing about this approach for stochastic problems is it allows you to use the Gaussian rule. So everything is e to the i theta here. And if you're looking at expectation values of e to the i theta, you can, you can always bring the expectation values up into the exponent. And so then you end up looking at, at expectation values of different paths that are, that are uh, uh, they're moving through the random medium. Are you missing an i there in the bottom of the No, no, that's a remarkable thing. You take, if theta is a Gaussian random variable, zero mean Gaussian random variable, this is real. Yeah. And, and it works for path integrals in addition just to normal random variables. So, so the way the formalism goes, you write the sound speed here as a C naught out in front. You have the background wave vibe, it's just dictated by U naught. You have the random perturbations in U. The path is an integral over this Lagrangian. Lagrangian looks kind of what you would expect from classical mechanics. So you kind of like have a kinetic energy term, like y dot squared over two. But in this case, the dot is, where did I write that? If I forgot to put, oh yeah, the over dot means ZDX. So in quantum mechanics, it's DDT. So X is like the independent variable in the wave approach and in quantum mechanics, it's time. So it sort of looks like a kinetic energy minus potential energy sort of thing, a typical Lagrange. And so the nice thing now, when you put that into the path integral, you kind of have the deterministic part here. So even not just having to do with these two things. So that's whatever the path is doing. And now we just integrate over the path what the random variations are. So you fix the path, you get the phase of, along the path, the deterministic part, and then you get an additional stochastic part. And so this still is pretty intractable uh, <laughs> at this point. And you have to do something because the, the path variables uh, can depend on all sorts of combinations of, of space uh, of X, Y, and Z. And so what you do to make this workable is you expand around the, the unperturbed ray uh, to second order. So you get a quadratic uh, path integral and it yields what essentially like a harmonic oscillator type of path integral. And that one you could actually solve by relatively easy standard methods. Is the Born approximation? Obtainable then as a longer term so that as a limit to this. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen a connection between that, but you would imagine so. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, because there's no presumable. Well, there's, there's there's no approximations here other than this quadratic thing, and in that limit, you should really collapse down to the born. That's very interesting. Well, anyway, um, there's a, the path integral approach has not worked that great for intensity moments. So like getting the scintillation index uh, has had lots of problems, but what's been the most useful thing is the mutual coherence function, like a second moment. So what this ends up being is that it's a double path integral. So P, P star delta now is a double path integral over this now difference of the phases of the two different paths. And again, you use the Gaussian rule and you're essentially looking at the structure function of these two different paths. We can bring this up into the exponent. And so what the key to solving this thing is finding sort of the region for path space 
that provide the main contributions to, to the, the interval. So again, it's kind of think about stationary phase. Like what are the places where you're getting the phases kind of matching up that, where there's these things are close to canceling each other out. And what happens, what's amazing is the simple result here is now that the mutual coherence function with some delta. So this could be space, X, Y, or Z, or it could be frequency. That's another one looking at uh, wide band signals, but it all involves this structure function here. And the structure function is given here by this expression uh, and also in terms of the paths here. And what happens too in the, in the path integral calculation is that you get some delta functions then that reduce this structure function to the paths from the unperturbed rays. So you actually, you, to calculate that structure function, you're using the unperturbed paths, not the perturbed paths. And so this, uh, some of the approximations that you can make here are that uh, these, this, these, these structure functions are quadratic in the separation variable. So as time evolves or as Z changes or as Y changes, and it's kind of interesting, you, you get a nice kind of rule of thumb about how these coherences go. So you essentially take the time scale. So the time coherence is really the time scale of the ocean divided by the RMS phase that you get. So what happens, that's saying that over T ocean, you get phi, uh, phi amount of phase. And so the, the rate is really the important thing. I kind of one over that. How quickly is the phase changing given the changes in the ocean? And again, this is, has some nice opportunities for the inverse problem because now if you look at time coherence, it's, set, it's sensitive to the time evolution of the ocean. Depth coherence is sensitive to the depth structure. Why uh, transverse coherence is sensitive to the horizontal structure. And I've shown you this plot already, this is just some coherences that we calculated for the Philippine Sea. So again, if you want to learn more, a lot of this stuff is in uh, in this book, and there's a lot of to other topics I've really gotten to. But um, yeah, this was the follow-on to the book by Flete, Dash, and Monk, and Watson and Zachariasen. Um, so kind of the main things is that you know these random and complex media kind of show some nice wave propagation concepts so refraction diffraction interference wave field stability uh very interesting question about this wave field stability problem you know you have what happens when you have these nonlinear ray equations that give you unpredictable ray paths but then the wave equation is linear linear and predictable but the wave field is complex so how does that behave? Uh, how do those two things kind of get reconciled? But they do give us some insights into the interplay of these different processes. And, and I imagine they apply in a lot of other fields too. I'm pretty excited about some of the remote sensing possibilities using statistical wave field observables. So you can imagine using weak fluctuation theory to measure the internal wave spectrum and see how the Garrett Monk spectrum might uh, be driven by variations in sources and sinks of internal waves in the ocean. And you might be able to see how the spectrum responds as sources and sinks kind of get turned on and turned off. Observing turbulence and boundary layers, I think would be really interesting, especially in the deep ocean. It's complicated in the upper ocean because there's critters and other things that scatter the sound that, that aren't turbulent. But if you had clear water in the deep ocean, I think you could do it. Uh, really interesting. Uh, suggestion that Walter made back in the 80s about measuring ocean stress fields, especially from internal waves. So measuring U prime, W prime, and now it's actually taking into account the velocity. So you transmit two waves across a, a, a slice of ocean. And so the difference travel times tell you about the velocity, the sum travel times tell you about the uh, vertical lifting of the interfaces. And so you get a, a, a U prime W prime type of thing. Uh, sensing of macro turbulence by surface waves. So there's a nice relationship between the structure function of, of surface wave angle and the spectrum of vorticity in the ocean. Um, I imagine some really 
interesting things you might be able to do with crustal heterogeneity, so looking at seismic waves. I know my advisor was looking at uh, data from one of the nuclear nuclear test uh, facilities up in Norway. I think it was called Norsar, and so they were, they were looking at the details of the seismic signals that are coming up into this big seismic array, uh, listening to the Russians and what they're doing. So, um, hope some of these ideas may be interested uh, going forward in the next uh, decade or so, and maybe earlier. So, thanks very much. Need to take any questions? <laughs> John, that was great. I have to go. Okay, thanks, Paul. Yeah. So, thanks for stopping in. Yeah. Uh, I think I have a question. So, I'll read a little. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm just, you know, your mu function, the sort of medium function. Yeah, yeah. If, if that were white noise in space and time, which is a kind of a worst case for everything, but then I think in that limit, the problem gets easy again. Is there, is that of any interest? Uh, yeah, so what happens, it, the, the strength of the variability depends a lot on actually having a longer correlation length where things can, add up <laughs> yeah so if you if you had completely uncorrelated space and time uh i think you could work it out I'm yeah sure is, is it, it, it of any use at all do you ever to compare with the, the more yeah no i haven't thought of that's an interesting idea because we've always been sort of i mean that's been the idea of the acoustic measurement it kind of gives you a measure of the correlation scale <laughs> Um, and that's usually the thing that we're, we're after. But if you had complete white, this was sort of the difference between a stochastic problem with white noise and colored noise. Yeah. And I think there's white noise. Multiplicative white noise. Yeah, and I think you're right. That's that's usually an easier problem. Yeah, if it's Gaussian and it's white. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to look into see what uh, maybe is Isn't that kind there. of like the fully saturated regime you were talking about earlier, though? Where it just kind of comes to the central limit theorem, you have like a white ocean. Yeah, well, you would eventually get to that. Yeah, yeah, where you just you've generated enough, you know, interfering paths to to get you that central yeah. limit theorem result. But whether so, you get there closer, whether you get there faster with white noise compared to colored noise, I'm yeah. not quite sure what. Yeah, how that. I think you would. Yeah, because the red noise will have some correlation to it, right? Yes, in some cases that that helps you because it builds up the effect. Yeah. yeah, when you're going through a certain layer, you, you're building up a lot of phase variation, or you're building up some some curvature of the ray paths, and then when it goes into another layer, and it just builds that up again. Right. Whereas with white noise, it's kind of like a like a random walk or something like that. You just yeah, from point to point. Your I mean, angle and <laughs> I mean, some of the mantra right, is like if you get to the like partially saturated, you get information about the ocean, you know. Mm -hmm. But then once you go to the fully saturated, you kind of lose information because there's just so much going on. At least that's the yeah. way I see it, right? Like, like yeah. seeing the caustics and stuff that tells you something about the medium, but then yeah. seeing the speckling, it you know. Yeah, as you move Less further so. and further out, yeah. your most information you have is in the weak fluctuation regime, where right. the spectrum of the ocean and the spectrum of the signal are directly related, except for some filters. Right. Uh, but then, yeah, as you go through more complicated interact multiple interactions, then you kind of lose memory a little bit of what. I mean, it doesn't matter what the you know perturbation is; it's just giving an interference interference effects. Any more questions? I, one yeah. question about the last part of the correlation lengths. I mean, for an experiment, would you suggest doing smaller? Like, if you had two hydrophones or something, would you put them far apart or would you put them close? Or is there an optimal geometry for them to be measuring all these different coherence scales? Yeah. So what you would what you would try to do would be to uh, figure out what you expect the coherence scales to be, and then you design an array that's sort of bigger than those ones, and you can kind of see how they might be changing over time as you 
maybe go through the tidal cycle or maybe a storm passes overhead or maybe some eddies are you know come in and out of the propagation path um, you would definitely want to go to a higher frequency to to be a little more sensitive to the smaller details and the spectrum and then the thing you know matt and i've talked a lot about and it, this is trying to be um, it, it puts a lot more constraints on how precise your navigation and timing have to be because you're looking at smaller signals in the in the acoustic travel time and so there's a lot of interesting challenges there and really trying to do that better go up to a mid frequency where you're more sensitive and then deal with all the challenges of navigating things to maybe centimeters and having try, you know, timing precision well, yeah. down to maybe hundreds of a yeah. millisecond or something. You like want that. more more to assets. Yeah, I would try. Yeah, try to do it with more to assets. Um, and then the, maybe if you could find a place where you could have, actually put things on. I mean, in the old days, they built these huge towers, and they, you know, so you didn't have to worry about more emotion. They, they couldn't yeah. really calculate it back then. But they could do that well. So you could do something with a fixed, maybe with a fixed yeah. asset, with a canyon, or I don't know. Like Cobb, Cobb's Peak, yeah, or, or, yeah, our yeah, made experiment yeah. or the um, Azores experiment that was done in the 70s. But yeah, it would be really interesting, especially this thing that Walter had about doing the U prime W prime, you know, for the uh, internal waves, right? You know, what are those kind of fluxes? You know, they in the ocean models, they assume that. You know, momentum diffuses through the model, right? But with internal waves, it's propagating, or, mm. and so to the extent that um, you can, whether you can actually see the effect of radiating internal waves moving momentum around and having sources and sinks, uh, whether that gives a you know, significant body force on the fluid. So, uh, if there's no more questions, I'm going to see if there's questions. Uh, well, we can thank you all again for a very good time. Uh, I want to welcome to join our seminar uh, tomorrow, too, at noon. Uh, it will be a talk on uh, underground water. So, I'm welcome to very nice and stamper. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm just here. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, with Jacob that's gonna come by. <laughs> and. I'm in Walter's office. I think it's two two oh eight. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just oh, yeah. yeah. um, yeah. 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 started to get good at some interaction. Probably all the yeah, right yeah. above. Yeah, so I think it's Rebel two two oh eight. Oh, you guys still have little. We have for a while just for so people who are going to do briefings. I guess um, two we more weeks. Done. All right. And there was a bunch in the summer after the second experiment was done. I think we're supposed to have them again over there. Uh -huh. Kind of dreadful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if, uh, I don't know. It's yeah. all right.